Hey, what's up, YouTubers? It's me again, Brian, aka Gamer55551. And I am back with another video, uh, another top, a, this one a top 10 video, and this one will be the top 10 Nintendo Switch games of 2018, or at least the ones that I thought uh, I, I thought were my top 10 pick, though. Um, if you missed my one I did on the PlayStation 4, which was the top 9, I'll have a link in the description of this video, and you can check it out. Um, for me, though, the Nintendo Switch in 2018 was certainly... It certainly wasn't a terrible year for them. It certainly had some heavy hitters, especially with, you know, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee and Smash Brothers, though. But I felt, and I felt this was kind of an off year for Nintendo, or at least for the Nintendo Switch, compared to 2017, where we had, like, big heavy hitters, especially with games like Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey, and surprises like seeing Doom 2016 on the Nintendo Switch. So, to me, it just felt a little bit, this year was kind of like, just felt a bit of an off year for, for the Nintendo Switch, at least from my perspective. That's not to say the Switch didn't have any games, or had... Or the games were bad or anything. It had a lot of good games, though. It may not be it may not be every game they had was for everybody, but there were some good ones. So, why don't we get started with our top ten? But before we do that, actually, wait. Before we do that, we're going to start off with the first part, and this one's going to be um, honorable mentions. So, these are games that um, didn't make it into my top ten, though, but are still worth taking a look and trying out yourself, though. So we'll start off with the first one, and that is um, Su Sushi Striker, The Way of Tsuchiyo. Um, this was an interesting puzzle game when this came out for the Nintendo Switch. It also came out for the Nintendo 3DS, though. Um, it, the whole idea of matching the sushi just matching the sushi together to get the dishes that you throw to your enemies and all. It was sort of a fun, interesting game to try out. Not everybody was thrilled about the game, mostly because many felt like it was a mobile game put on a Nintendo Switch and everything. And I can understand to some degree, but I did enjoy it though. I, I didn't I did have some fun with Sushi Striker the way of Sushio. Uh, the next one would be um, Mario Tennis Ace as well. Um, this one, not again, another controversial one for some people. Not everybody was like thrilled with the game. Some people felt certain content was lacking and all that stuff. But I enjoyed it though. I thought it was like a fun, another one of those miscellaneous sports games that um, Nintendo has done with their iconic Mar with iconic Mario and so forth. Whether it's you know him playing soccer, which is like you know the Mario Striker game, would like to see that make a comeback. Two Mario Karts, and this one was definitely fun as well. The t the game it has sort of an arcadey feel to it. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a miscellaneous sport, but a fun miscellaneous sport, though. The story itself is just a little weird, especially with the tennis racket, which many have compared it to, like, the Affinity Gauntlet from the Avengers Infinity War and all that stuff. But either way, I did have fun. I did have fun with this one. The next one on my list is... Excuse me. Uh, Diablo 3 Eternal Collection, though. Um, as some of you may be aware of, this game was rumored for quite some time. There were rumors that Diablo 3 was going to come to the Nintendo Switch and so forth. And, well, eventually we finally got a report that came out that showed that the game was coming after all. And we learned that it will contain, that it contained all the DLCs and you can play as Gan Ganondorf as well. And... It is still fun and addictive action RPG, um, especially on the Nintendo Switch, which is very impressive that it runs at a 60 frames per second while maintaining a 720p when undocked. I think 920p when docked, I'm not 100% sure, but it's still a fun action RPG, whether it's with friends or just by yourself and so forth. It may not be for everyone, especially if you own another version of Diablo 3, whether it's on your PC or on the PS4 or Xbox One. But the idea of playing Diablo 3 on the go, can't turn that, can't turn that down. All right, the next one is, and I didn't get a chance to review this one, though I wish I could have had the time, and that is Monster Hunter Ult Generation Ultimate. Now, this one, this is certainly a game that a lot of people were kind of asking for, at least for the Switch, for Nintendo fans to be exact, because of the fact that the game was originally announced as Monster Hunter, I think, 
double X or something like that. And there was some back and forth of whether Capcom was bringing it over or not. And eventually they did. And while it may not be as approachable as, say, um, Monster Hunter World was in any way, it's still an enjoyable game and it still is fun nevertheless, even if, if it's not as approachable as Monster Hunter World. Visually speaking, it looks like a, <clears throat> excuse me, a high-res version of, say, of the 3DS outing, though. Plus, there's also the ability you can transfer your save data from Monster Hunter Generations and bring it over to the, um, we can go over to the Switch version, which is certainly nice. So, Monster Hunter Generation Ultimate definitely goes on my list. It definitely goes on my honorable mention. Uh, the next one is... Penny Punching Princess. This was an interesting idea for a game from NIS America to bring over, though. The whole idea of not only is it sort of a beat-em-up with a top-down view, but the whole idea that you can use money to bribe enemies and so forth to basically, you know, fight on your side or bribe, like, a trap to set up it to, you know use against, like, the enemies as well. So the whole idea and the whole greed thing was just interesting, weird, but still enjoyable nevertheless. Plus, I'm a big fan of, like, beat-em-ups and all that stuff. So, Punny Pinching Princess is definitely on my list. I'm on my honorable mention. <clears throat> Next one on the list is Dead Cell. Now, interesting thing about this one is I never, I didn't even hear about this game until the controversy surrounding um, the I uh, surrounding the review of a former IGN that supposedly took a review from someone else and tried to pass it off as his, and he kind of caught got caught red-handed on that one though. But putting that controversy aside, um, Dead Cell is a fun and yet brutal game. Think one part Strider, one part Metro Metroidvania, and one part Dark Souls, and you get an idea of how this game plays. Um, Art style wise, it looks really good. Um, music wise is also very nice and gameplay is definitely fun. It is a challenging game like Dark Souls and this is the kind of game that you will die a lot. So you have to sort of be careful and so forth. But overall, definitely a fun game on top of the... Oh, and also came with an art book if you got the physical version. Alright, the next one is basically um, SNK Heroines Tag Team Frenzy, though. While it may not be a King of Fighter game, although there are rumors that it could be coming to the Nintendo Switch, this was, or, you know, the newest version, though, this is probably the closest one you can get. I like the fact that it's accessible, especially if you're not good at fighting games. But at the same time, that's kind of both a blessing and a curse. It's great if, like me, if you're not great at fighting games, but it might be an issue for those who've been enjoying fighting games, particularly SNK style ones, for a long time. But still, it is a so it is something worth trying, even if the whole selling point is obviously the fan service. And which, eh, you know what? Love it or hate it, though, it, everyone has their different tastes. But nevertheless, I applaud um, SNK for bringing this over, uh, bringing this over to the Nintendo Switch. Um, here's to hoping, though, that a true fighting game like the King of Fighters comes to the a new entry of the King of Fighters, not ports of the old ones, comes to the Nintendo Switch. So SNK Heroin makes it on as an honorable mention. Uh, the next one on this list is. Payday 2. Um, this was sort of interesting to see a title like this come over to the Nintendo Switch because I wasn't really sure how a game that is normally designed as a multiplayer only experience was going to work on a system that is pro that was promoted as a game where ba a system where basically the idea is it, it's a console you could take with you on the go. Not to mention this not to mention the game also was released on PS4, Xbox One, and PC as well. But despite despite not despite it not being, shall we say, um, the best looking version, obviously though, it still was a fun game, and the game was is certainly playable as a single player game, depending on how, the difficulty and how much patience you have. Obviously, this is de designed for multiplayer, and that well, that's great to have something like that. 
the lack of a voice chat option kind of hurts it a little bit unless you decide to use other options like say discord or anything like that but overall payday 2 deserves a honorable mention on the list all right, the next one up here is, and now some might disagree with me on this one, is Shaq Fu, A Legend Reborn. Now, I'm sure most of the people know about the iconic Shaq Fu, or what many claim as the worst game of all time, although I think that's kind of debatable. I assume there are other games that make it on that list as well, but... And so it was certainly interesting to see Shaquille O'Neal push for a campaign to get do a Shaq Fu game, a game that that game that he wanted to to redeem himself for the awful 1994 game. And having played it though, I will say this: it may not be, it may not be, it may not give games like Double Dragon or Final Fight or Streets of Rage a run for its money or anything like that. But it's not a bad beat 'em up for bad beat 'em up at all. Okay. It, it's not terrible, but it's not it's not going to be game of the year material though. And I <clears throat> excuse me. And I do have to give Shaquille O'Neal credit for actually going through with this though. Again, may not be for everyone, but I will give Shaq Fu: A Legend Reborn at least an honorable mention. The next one on this list, though, is Gal Gun 2 for the Nintendo Switch. Um, when I first saw the, when I first heard about the series, though, and first saw videos of it, though, my original attention, and I'm talking about like the original Gal Gun and Gal Gun Double Piece, was that I thought mm, there's no way they're going to bring this over this is here over here to the West, but yet somehow they did, and on top of that. Not only not only did the first one sell well, they decided to bring over a sequel, and they brought it, and they brought it over here for the um, Nintendo Switch. And the gameplay is a little bit different in some degrees, but it's still the same. The whole idea is it's an on rail shooter, but this one you now have a bit of a 360 degree um, turn, be able to rotate your character 360 degree. And obviously, judging by the art picture and so forth. You probably know what the main selling point of this game is, and it's obviously the fan service, especially when you have a back cover that says, um, Welcome to Pansu Paradise, and so forth. So, it obviously you know who the audience was for, and I gotta give credit for Nintendo for allowing this on their system. In fact, I gotta give Nintendo credit that for them to allowing an uncensored version of Dead or Alive Extreme Volleyball 3 Scarlet to be on there, and so forth. So. But you know what? It's it's a niche title. It won't appeal for to everybody. But you know what? I'm giving it an honorable mention anyway. So Gal Gun 2 is an honorable mention on this list. Um, the next one on my list though is um, Starlink Battle for Atlas. Though um, Starlink is a game that I'm kind of it's sort of mixed about on. On one hand, the space combat and the gameplay is surprisingly fun, even for following the tire, tired and true Ubisoft open world kind of approach, though. But at the same time, the action, the whole idea of buying, you know, the Toys for Life concept just felt like did it really need that con concept, considering the fact that <clears throat> the whole Toys for Life thing has sort of gone the way of the dodo or at least with some of them except for amiibos that still continue on um not to mention the fact that the digital version has all the ships and parts which kind of almost makes the um almost makes the physical copy seem like it's not worth buying and all that stuff on top of that the switch the starlink uh, for the Switch also had basically um, Star Fox in it, making it mostly the definitive version since it has other missions from, has exclusive missions from the, with Fox and Cloud and so forth. And the fact that the Switch version was probably the only one that sold better than say the PS4 and the Xbox One version, I understand I mean, in the UK it entered in at number 14, but the Switch version was the best selling version out of all three of them, which kind of a mixed bag so I'm just I'm kind of mixed on this game I don't hate it or anything like that I, I think it's enjoyable I just think the toys for life part probably 
could not, it probably should not have been added to it. And the whole addition of Star Fox in it, while it's nice, it kind of raises the question of could this game have survived without Fox McCloud and the whole Star Fox crew being in the game. So, but it is still enjoyable and I will at least give it an honorable mention. The next one I do want to talk about is a digital only game and this one obviously is The Messenger from Devolve Digital though. Um, this one was sort of, this was definitely a fun one. Um, this was basically a homage to the, the game, homage to games like the Ninja Gaiden series on during the NES day and I definitely like the fourth wall humor where the game pretty much sort of pokes fun of itself and so forth. So it was really fun especially the part where you switch between the 8-bit and the 16-bit and the part where it goes into kind of the metroidvania part I know not everyone likes that part, but I definitely enjoy it. I'm, re I'm really a big fan of the whole metroidvania genre in general So for me though um, The messenger definitely gets an honorable mention the next one on the list is basically Dark Souls remastered for the Nintendo switch now, this was kind of an interesting game because originally this was supposed to come out when the PS4 and the Xbox One and the PC version came out, but unfortunately it got delayed and not everybody was kind of thrilled with that though. But in the end, the game did come out and it still is, of course, Dark Souls being Dark Souls, that difficulty where you have to be, don't you, we have to be very careful when you're going in to fight the enemies to watch your health, to watch your stamina meter, and so forth. It's basically it's that kind of that's that kind of difficulty that's going to appeal to some people, but turn off others though. And surprisingly, the game's not bad for this on the Switch. Obviously, visually, it's not going to look as good as the PS4 or Xbox One or PC. Although that's debatable, since some people there has been some people who have complained about those visuals. Whether you like them or not, that's going to be up to you. But the idea of bringing this on the go is definitely a nice addition. So it's definitely, so I will give Dark Souls Remaster a um, honorable mention though. And as much as I like Dark Souls, I have to say, I still think Noel, N-O-I-H, if I'm saying that correctly from Koei Techno, still remains my favorite Dark Souls-like game. The next game on the list I'm going to talk about is another digital only title and this one is Warframe. Now this was interesting to see a title like this come to the Nintendo Switch. Because again like with Payday 2 I wasn't sure if a title like this along with Paddling or Fortnite was going to how that was going to work onto the Switch and as with Payday 2 uh, my concern was about give, given the fact that the whole point of the Nintendo Switch is a console you bring with you on the go that wasn't I just wasn't a hundred percent sure about it but it turns out to, turns out nevertheless those games came out and found its audience and obviously Warframe did um, Warframe obviously is a free-to-play game and in the age of where microtransaction is under the microscope especially after what EA pulled with Star Wars Battlefront 2 though I can understand why some people may not be happy about it that said I will say that this is a free-to-play game I'm willing to support at the very least. Yes, there's microtransactions, but I feel as though the game doesn't force you to use the microtransactions if you don't want to, though. And at least I'm glad that the developers have been very open to, the, open to their fan base and so forth and have done basically what Destiny could never do, although now with... Bungie now having Destiny after splitting with Activision, it'll be interesting to see where that franchise goes from there. But overall, my take on Warframe is definitely, it's a fun game. It's worth downloading. The question is, are you willing to tolerate the fact that there is microtransactions in the game? That's going to come down to your preference and your, and your approach to microtransactions in general. The next game on my list is 
Mega Man 11. Now, Mega Man has kind of had a rough history. Ever since Capcom canceled several games on the Mega Man series, like Mega Man Legends 3, which many Mega Man fans are still a little bit burned about, and Keiji Inafune leaving Capcom, there was his, there was thoughts that Mega Man was pretty much dead, and that Mighty Number no. Nine was going to be the game to that's going to replace Mega Man. Well, obviously Mighty Number no. no. Nine came out. We all saw how big of a debacle of a mess that turned out, and it has been left in obscurity, and it's pretty much, pretty much now has become a laughing stock. Well, Capcom, of course, brought Mega Man 11 out this year, and it was the first game without Keiji Inafune being involved. And surprisingly, it turned out to be a fun game. It turned out to be, it brought back the classic Mega Man, but added some new stuff into it as well, ranging from the whole gear system, which some people love or hate, to the addition of adding difficulties, such as ranging from like newcomer, easy, normal, hard, or so forth, for those who may have been turned off from past Mega Man games though. So it was definitely nice to see the classic Blue Bomber returns um, as well. As ho here's to hope that if the rumors are true that Mega Man 12 is in the works, and here's to hoping that we also get a return of maybe the Mega Man X series as well, and maybe, just maybe, try to revive Mega Man Legends 3 if that ever, ever happens. And last but not least, as part of our honorable mention, the last one is Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. Um, this was an interesting project um, released when it became clear that Bloodstained, um, uh, the other Bloodstained game, I sh shoot, I forgot the name of it, Damn it, was delayed to next year, which we're hoping that it turns out as well. So in the meantime, Indie Creates brought us basically what is a side story slash prequel um, to the Bloodstained, uh, Ritual of the Night, I believe that's called, Ritual of the Night, okay, with Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, which plays like a traditional old-school Castlevania game, which is nice to have, though, in an age where Konami has, well, outside of the excellent Castlevania TV show on Netflix, though, it's really, um, what game does Konami put out now these days when it's not squished in with microtransactions or anything like that. So it was nice to see the classic Castlevania form series live on with Bloodstain, And it was definitely a fun 2D game, especially from Indie Creates. And you definitely got a little bit of that, somewhat of a, that Shovel Knight's vibe out of it, though. Um... I am hoping Ritual of the Night turns out to be good, though. That game has... A lot of people have been waiting for that game. I am hoping. I am really hoping it does turn out to be good and that the wait is well worth it and it doesn't turn into another Mighty Number no. 9 situation. So far, it hasn't gotten there, at least as far as I'm aware of, but I can understand some people are concerned about that. Okay, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to get to part two, and we're going to start with our top ten. It'll be through ten through five, so take a quick break, and we will be right <clears throat> back. Okay, and we are back with part two of our video on the top 10 Nintendo Switch games of 2018. So now that we got past the honorable mention, why don't we get started with with the top 10? And this one's going to be through 10 to 5. So we'll start off with the first one. Uh, number 10 on my list is Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. Now, I'm aware that Bethesda certainly had, did not have a great 2018. Uh, let's be honest with ourselves. The whole Fallout 76 debacle really screwed them over and honestly they deserve the criticism let's be clear i'm not saying that bethesda is immune to those criticisms that being said though they did release one of their games for the nintendo switch uh this year with wolfenstein 2 the new colossus a port of the 2017 release on the ps4 xbox one and pc with of course obviously the one and only if you can see right here uh panic button handling the development after they handled the surprisingly good um, Doom 2016 on Nintendo Switch. And it still amazes me how well 
It's amazing to me how they were able to squeeze this game onto the Nintendo Switch. Granted, it's not perfect. Obviously, it's not going to be the best looking version. That's going to go to the PS4, Xbox One, and PC. But the fact that they are able to get this game running, even at a stable 30 frames per second, is still, still amazing to be exact. So, I will say number 10 goes on to my list of Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus. Um, here's to hoping when that Wolfenstein 3 comes to the Nintendo Switch. We know Doom Eternal is. We'll have to wait and see. And here's to hoping that Bethesda will support, will continue to support the Switch with some maybe some of their other games like Dishonor, Evil Within. I'll be happy with Fallout 4, 4, not 76, but Fallout 4. And I'm probably one of the few people that actually enjoyed Fallout 4, to be exact. So, number 10, Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus. Alright, the next one on the list at number 9 is... Um, Kirby Star Allies. Now, I'm not the biggest Kirby fan out there, and I have played several, but I have played some several Kirby's game before, and it's that those games are certainly fun, especially with the whole idea of Kirby sucking up enemies and basically taking up their powers, and Kirby Star Allies continues that. It does add some new things, such as the ability to team up with friends and so forth, and support four-player co-op, although I still think it's kind of odd that while it offers couch co-op, which is nice, it would have been nice if they offer online play. Um, for some, the game might be too easy, but for some others, it's still enjoyable in a way, and I still think, and the art style is certainly nice, even though looks like the game could have run at 60 frames per second although it runs at a good 30 frames per second so so overall number nine kirby star allies still a fun game especially if you're a kirby fan right. number eight on my list is um south park fractured but whole i unfortunately didn't get a chance to review the switch version but i do have a review of the game based off the ps4 i don't have a link in the description if you want to check that out though as far as licensed games goes, South Park Fractured But Whole and The Stick of Truth, which I believe that's available to download on the Nintendo eShop, are actually one of the good ones, though. The game is surprisingly, this case makes fun of the superhero genre and all that stuff, but the combat is still enjoyable. It plays... Combat in um, Fractured But Whole kind of feels like it follows more of a XCOM and Fire Emblem approach where Stick of Truth follows a more traditional RPG, mostly uh, Mario RPG to be exact. And of course, it's the South Park humor, whether you either love it or hate it, but it is certainly an enjoyable um, game nevertheless, even if it's absurd, even if the whole thing is just weird and so forth, even the whole premise is just weird and so forth. So number eight, South Park, Fractured But Whole, and to me, it's one of the few licensed games that are actually good. <laughs> All right, um, at number seven is Shining Resource Reframe, though. Um, the Shining series is kind of a series I've played maybe a, a little bit here and there. The most ones I remember were the two on the PlayStation 2, I think Shining Force EX. And I think Shining Tears, though. So it was certainly interesting to see them bring Sega bring this one over, which I believe was only in Japan, and I think it was based off the PS3 version, though. And it is surprisingly a fun game, even though it's more of a niche title to be exact. The combat plays very similar to kind of the Bandai Namco Tales games, which certainly isn't bad or anything like that. I'm starting to get into that series a little bit more. And um, the story, of course, is your typical, like, sort of anime approach and all that stuff. Especially when you can have a relationship with any of the other characters and so forth. But but overall, it is a, it's a fun RPG um, in a way. Um, it may not be for everyone. It may not be like the classic Shining Force series that some people like, though. But it's definitely a fun one. And would be love to see more entries in the Shining series, especially like to see more of it come to Nintendo Switch. All right, the number six title here is Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition. Um, while I still feel that Fire Emblem Warriors is 
an improvement over Hyrule Warriors, mostly because of um, some certain things, such as the ability to play the game in action or movie mode. Um, I think cinematic mode or movie mode has the game run it. Uh, um, yes? Okay. Alright, that's someone else. It's just someone coming out. Just picking up somebody, though. <laughs> All right. Apologize for that. Alright. Anyway, um, I, like I said, though, I felt like Fire Emblem Warriors was a bit better than basically... Um, should we say a, a, a bit it was was slightly better than Hyrule Warriors, mostly because of ranging from the graphical options, such as playing the game at 1080p 30 frames per second or 720p 60 frames per second in docked only, to the use of you know the elements from the Fire Emblem series, such as the weapon wheel and the whole strategy element, though. But Hyrule Warriors still remains a favorite of mine, um, mostly because I'm mostly a Zelda fan, though, and it's just. I just enjoy this more than any of the other than the other Warriors games to a certain degree. Maybe it has to do with the Zelda Lord and so forth, and maybe the fact that they've improved on certain areas, such as you can actually now move your characters to certain parts, though not nearly as good as say not nearly as well as say um I really as well as Fire Emblem Warriors, but nevertheless it's still enjoyable, and it's definitely the definitive edition with all the content so and so forth. So, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition enters in at um, number six. And finally, at number five, though, we have Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. Now, this game, unfortunately, got wasn't exactly... Not everybody was thrilled about it when it was originally announced, I believe, back in 2014. Mostly because Nintendo was hyping up that this is a game that Retro Studios always wanted to work on. And many people thought it would be a brand new game. Only to find out it was Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. And that exactly did not sit well with everybody. Nevertheless, it was a fun game. And seeing David Wise return and make some of the music for it was certainly a nice addition. So, to see them port this game over to the Nintendo Switch is certainly... A good thing and it's definitely still as fun as it was when it was originally released on the Wii U. The new funky mode, um, not every I understand not everybody may not be may not like that mode or anything like that, but it's a nice one for those who are not you who may not be down with the difficulty of the game, which the game can be very difficult, especially in certain areas, but in a way I like that because it challenges your challenges your platforming skills in a way so number five donkey kong tropical freeze okay uh we're going to take a quick break and when we get back we're going to get to part three and this one will be from four to one so we'll take a little break and we will be right back Okay, and we are back with our third and final part of this top 10 Nintendo, top, or my top 10 pick for of the Nintendo Switch games of 2018. So now we're down with down to four to our to what will be our number one pick. So we'll start off with number four, and that is Valkyrie or Valkyria Chronicles 4. Now I'll be honest with you. I've, I've enjoyed the series though. It's been a favorite of mine, including the first one, which also got ported over to the Nintendo Switch as well. And it's, to me, it's sort of a hidden gem, especially ranging from that style that you give up a little bit of a World War One and World War II feel to that watercolor slash manga and art style to the whole battle system in general. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's always been, the first one has always been a fun game for me. Unfortunately, the second one is somewhat enjoyable, but there were some decisions I did not like, especially the leveling up. I never got a chance to play the third one, as that one was only released on the PSP, but only in Japan. Never saw the light of day over here in the West. And of course, um, 2017's Valkyrie Revolution didn't exactly sit well with everybody. I personally didn't hate the title, 
and all, and I applaud them taking it, it taking it into a different direction. But obviously, not everyone was a fan of it. So it was kind of interesting to see that another entry of the game was coming. Not only would it be a return back to basics, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, a return to the kind of the formula that was used in the first one, but it would also be coming to the Nintendo Switch as well. And it is still, just like the first one, it is still a fun game to be exact. I mean, yes, you could see some differences with the graphics in certain areas and all, but it's still the same game as it would be if you were playing on the PS4, Xbox One, or PC. There'll be some visual difference, and obviously the PC version runs at 60 frames per second, no matter, no matter how you look at it that way. But nevertheless, the combat is still enjoyable as it was like in the first one, though. The story is also enjoyable, even though I prefer the first Valkyrie Chronicle stories more over this one though but nevertheless valkyrie chronicle 4 is definitely a fun game and my hope is that we do see a fifth entry though and i would love to see see the series continue i would love to see them bring it to the nintendo switch and i would be down if they were to say remake valkyrie chronicles 2 or 3 and somehow bring that over here to the west indeed so number four valkyrie chronicles 4. All right, um, number three goes to Yeats um, Lasoma, if I'm saying the name correctly, if not, I apologize, of Dana for the Nintendo Switch. Um, the Yeats series or the Y's or the YS series, I only remember playing one entry, and this was a while back, back during the um, PlayStation 2 era. There was one that was that was available to play. Um, on the PS2 and the PSP, and it was a fun um, action RPG to be exact. Playing as one of the characters, playing as I think, what's what's the character's name? I think, mean, um, shoot, I forgot the name of the character. I my apologies on that. But either way, it was a fun action RPG. So to see this, see the game that originally started out on the PlayStation Vita before making their way to the PS4, Xbox One, and PC, and finally over to the Nintendo Switch is great and it is still as and it is certainly is enjoyable the game definitely has a bit of a warriors feel to it a little bit although it's not not exactly like the warriors games where you have to you know take over a, a keep or anything like that but nevertheless combat is fun it's a little bit a little bit of a fast pace but still enjoyable nevertheless especially when you switch between different characters and you use those characters to defeat certain enemies and so forth so Number three is the yeast yeast game right over here, though, and it's definitely an enjoyable one. I know they're making another one, but for now, I think that's exclusive for the PS4. Um, hopefully, we'll see more entries of the series come over to the Nintendo Switch. I would love to see that happen. All right, number two on my list is Bayonetta 2. No pun intended, especially with the Valkyrie Chronicles 4. Bayonetta 2 had a very interesting history, as originally um, Sega was not going to publish the game as they were re-evaluating and re-examining um, some of their IPs and some of their financial structures in a way, and Platinum wanted to do one, but obviously Sega wasn't, so Platinum, obviously the whole story is that Platinum started shopping around for anyone else that was willing to fund the game, even Microsoft and Nintendo, even Microsoft and Sony. And Nintendo was the one that was willing to approach Platinum and say, hey, yeah, we'll fund it. Make it exclusive to our system and we'll fund it. And the rest is history as Bayonetta 2 remained an exclusive. And when it came out on the Wii U and finally seeing the game ported over to Nintendo Switch is a nice addition, especially for those who may have missed out on the, on the game when it originally came out on the Wii U. And it's nice to see that the game is now on a system that is more popular now than it was before. Um, the game definitely plays homage to obviously the Devil May Cry series since the same people who worked on that are working on this one and it follows that tired true thing that Platinum's known for for their over-the-top action to be exact so it's definitely nice that they brought this game over to the Switch and it certainly helps as it builds up hype for the upcoming 
Bayonetta 3. Hopefully we'll hear some information on that one and hopefully it will come out this year. But number two definitely goes to Bayonetta 2. And last but not least, my number one game for the Nintendo Switch, and some may or may not agree with me on this one, is Octopath Traveler. It's my number one um, Nintendo Switch game for 2018. I remember hearing, seeing this game when it was originally announced at Nintendo's presentation back in January of 2017, when it was referred to as Project Octopath Traveler. It was basically developed by the same people that did the Bravely Default series and the I Am Sushuma. So it was really interesting to see this game, especially since it was a combination of of a mixture of like that old school JRPG with some of the visuals, with some updates here and there, not to mention seeing the game run on the Unreal Engine 4 to be exact. And it became a it became a gem for Switch owners. Um, the combat, follow, while follows the same kind of approach as you would see with the, uh, any other, with most JRPGs, it also adds some things and shakes things up, such as the ability to, when you attack an enemy with a weapon, you'll find out whether the enemy is weak with to that weapon or not. Not to mention, this also applies to magic spells as well. Um, having Playing not only each of the characters, discovering their own stories and so forth. So it was definitely a fun game to play and it's still a fun game to enjoy even to this day. And that's why, and also the visuals of the game. Uh, this is a good example of how, how you don't have to have the most fancy bells and whistles with your graphics. You can always have an art style that can more than make up for it. And like God of War to a certain degree, Octopath Traveler shows that you don't, that single player games are still relevant. You don't need to make your games as a live service and anything like that. And while I'm not completely against DLCs, when especially when they're done correctly, it shows that you could have a complete game that doesn't always need to have DLCs and it becomes a success though. Unlike say Final Fantasy 15, where obviously they were pumping out DLCs because they spent all this money on this game and they need to somehow make it up for it though. So. Number one on my list has to go do Octopath Traveler. I know some people may say Smash Brothers, but I have to go with Octopath Traveler as my number one game of 2018 for the Nintendo Switch. <clears throat> okay, um, this concludes this um, top 10 Nintendo Switch, uh, my, my top 10 of Nintendo Switch games of 2018. And again, these are my opinion. What are yours? What are, what would be your top 10 Nintendo Switch games of 2018? Um, do you agree with my list? Um, do you disagree with my list? Um, do you have a different top 10? Um, do you have a different honorable mention? Um, as always, sound off on the comment section below. Let me know what you think. And I hope you hit that like button. I would appreciate it. And I hope you do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, Feel free to share this video if you want to, and feel free to donate to my channel if you like. If you do, um, you can either do it through PayPal me or Patreon. Links will be in the description of this video. And I will see you again next time when I do another video. Hopefully that will be soon. Till then, from Southern California, wish you all a good evening then. Bye!